A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis of Shankar Ayes Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 24th of May 2023. And displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. And a kind request to you all, those who haven't yet subscribed our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our future current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Now look at this small article here. It says that forest guard in the Similipal Tiger Reserve was killed by poachers on Monday night. So far forest department has identified 10 suspects. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now we are not going to see about the issue in this discussion. Instead we will use this opportunity to learn about Similipal Tiger Reserve. See Simlipal Tiger Reserve is located within the Mayurbunj district in the northernmost part of Odisha. Simlipal comes under the Deccan Peninsular Biogeographic Zone, Chota Nagpur Province and Mahanadian region. The terrain is mostly undulating and hilly combined with open grasslands and wooded areas. Now let us see important details about Simlipal Tiger Reserve. See Simlipal was formally designated as a Tiger Reserve under Project Tiger in May 1973. Later, the Odisha government declared Similipal as a wildlife sanctuary in 1979. And in 1980, Odisha government proposed 303 square kilometer of the sanctuary as national park. Subsequently, in 1994, Indian government declared Similipal as a biosphere reserve. And in May 2009, UNESCO included Similipal in its list of biosphere reserves. This is basic information about Similipal Tiger Reserve. Now talking about the forest type, firstly the Similipal is characterized by northern tropical moist deciduous forest. This type of forest is found all over the Similipal except the moist valleys and the southern and eastern aspects of hills. Secondly, dry deciduous hill forests are also seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. They are found mostly in eastern and southern Similipal with steep and exposed slopes. Thirdly, high level sal forests are also seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. These types of forests occur in plateaus above an elevation of 850 meter. And finally, grassland and savanna are also seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. And it is spread in small patches all over the area of the Tiger Reserve. Okay, this is all about the forest types seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. Now moving on to see about the biodiversity of Similipal Tiger Reserve. See, Similipal harbors a unique blend of Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats and sub-Himalayan plant species. The landscape supports 1076 plant species with 94 species of orchids. When it comes to fauna, the Similipal Tiger Reserve is known for the tiger, elephant and hill mina. It holds the highest tiger population in the state of Orisha. Apart from this, there are 55 species of mammals, 361 species of birds, 62 species of reptiles, 21 species of amphibians, 38 species of fishes, 164 species of butterflies and many species of insects and microfauna are also seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. This discussion we saw about Similipal Tiger Reserve. Then we saw about the forest types that are seen in Similipal Tiger Reserve. And finally, we saw some points regarding flora and fauna of Similipal Tiger Reserve. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this image here. It is given in the science page. It says that Chile's Patagonia is home to the largest continuous kelp forest in the world. So using this opportunity, we will learn about kelp forest in prelims perspective. So what is a kelp forest? After hearing the name forest, don't think that kelp is a plant or tree. Rather, it is a brown macro algae. These algae grow in dense groupings much like a forest on land. That's why they got the name kelp forest. See kelp forests are underwater ecosystems formed in shallow water. As you can see in this image, they look like plants, right? They have similarities other than the physical appearance of plant. See, kelps are autotrophs. Autotrophs are the producers in the food chain. This means that they create their own nutrients and energy. Like most autotrophs, kelp creates energy through a process called photosynthesis. Because of this only, kelp forests are always found in coastal areas and they require shallow and relatively clean water. Know that kelps do not have roots. Instead, they attach to the rocks in the sea floor. In place of true stems, kelps have stiff stipes which hold them up towards the sunlight. 
Here stipe means an organ resembling the stem or stalk of a plant. Now talking about the distribution of kelp forests. See kelp thrives in cold nutrient rich waters. Kelps live further from the tropics. They do not overlap with coral reefs, mangrove forests and warm water seagrass beds. Now look at this map here. This map here shows you the distribution of kelp forest in the world. As you can see different species of kelp grow in the temperate and polar coastal waters. And note one important point here. Kelps do not occur in the coastal waters of India. Now finally before concluding our discussion let us see the significance of kelp forests. Firstly kelp forests provide three dimensional underwater habitat for thousands of species of invertebrates, fishes and other algae. The animals also use the forest as shelters from predators. Secondly kelp forests provide food for many fish species and animals such as seals, sea lions, whales, sea waters and shore birds. Thirdly kelp species are used as a binding agent in products like ice cream, cereal, yogurt, toothpaste, lotion etc. And finally the kelp forests help in conserving the marine biodiversity of the region. Ok this is all about the significance of kelp forests. But practices like destructive fishing, over harvest for commercial use and other factors like coastal pollution, accidental damage caused by boat are endangering the kelp forests. So in order to protect this unique ecosystem, area based management should be utilized. Apart from this, kelp forests should be designated as marine protected areas. Okay, now that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what is kelp forest, then we saw about the distribution of kelp forests in the world, then we moved on to see about the significance of kelp forest and finally we saw some points regarding the threats to kelp forest. Now with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this editorial here. This article is speaking about the BRICS forum. Now before we get into a detailed analysis, let me explain you the crux of this editorial. See many multilateral groupings like the BRICS have faced many challenges due to COVID-19 conflicts and changes among member countries. But many nations still want to join BRICS. The author says that this is surprising because the influence of BRICS has decreased. See BRICS has done good things economically and politically but there are problems inside the group. I will explain the problem in a while. The article also says that now 19 countries want to join BRICS and they also have a desire for a global south forum. Therefore in the next BRICS meeting decisions on adding new members could be taken. Ok this is the central idea of this editorial. Now we will try to get a deeper understanding of this editorial from our exam perspective. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. First we will learn about BRICS so that you will get a clear picture. See BRICS is a group that includes 5 important emerging economies. They are Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. These countries have a significant impact on the world stage. To understand their importance, let's look at some numbers. See BRICS make up 41% of world's population and together they contribute to 24% of world's GDP. They also have a share of over 16% in the world trade. Also BRICS countries have played a crucial role in driving global economic growth and they have come together to discuss important matters across three main areas. They are political and security issues, economic and financial matters and cultural and people to people exchanges. Know that the term BRICS was coined in 2001 by economist Jim O'Neill who worked at Goldman Sachs. In his report, he highlighted the growing prospects of Brazil, Russia, India and China. Also he recognized the significant contributions of these countries to the world's production and population. This is all about the basics of BRICS. Now we will see the evolution of BRICS. To know about the evolution of BRICS, you should first understand about IBSA. Now what is IBSA? See the IBSA stands for India, Brazil and South Africa. The IBSA group was formed in 2003. It was basically created to strengthen cooperation and collaboration among these three emerging economies. Initially India, Brazil and South Africa saw many similarities and shared interests among themselves. So they realized that by working together they could tackle global challenges and advance their mutual interests. So they together formed IBSA group. Their main goals were to boost trade, investment and cultural exchanges between their nations. However things changed over the time within the IBSA group. This happened because China expressed its desire to join this IBSA group. 
but brazil and india insisted that the group is limited to democracies only and they did not allow china into the ibsa group response to this china made a strategic move china decided to bring south africa into the erstwhile bric group eventually south africa became a part of the group and the bric became brics and this move by the china overshadowed the ibsa group so this led to the establishment of brics now let's discuss the financial aspects of brics specifically the new development bank and the brics contingent reserve arrangement now first let's take new development bank see the new development bank that is the ndb was established by the leaders of brics countries during the fourth brics summit in 2012 the bank's main purpose is to mobilize resources for infrastructure and sustainable development projects in brics and other emerging economies So in 2014 during the 6th BRICS summit in Fortaleza the leaders signed an agreement to establish the new development bank they highlighted that a new development bank could strengthen cooperation among BRICS countries and it would complement efforts of other multilateral and regional financial institutions i know that the new development bank became fully operational in 2016 and its headquarters is located in Shanghai and each member country holds an equal number of shares that is 20% in the new development bank okay this is all about new development bank now moving on to brics contingent reserve arrangement see brics contingent reserve arrangement that is the cra is a framework designed to protect against global liquidity pressures it was basically established to address economic volatility and uncertain macroeconomic environments faced by emerging economies Know that this contingent reserve arrangement is often seen as a competitor to international monetary fund, and it is also considered an example of increasing South-South cooperation. Okay, this is all about BRICS contingent reserve arrangement. Now moving on to see about the points given in the editorial article. See, the editorial article has highlighted some achievements of BRICS. Basically, it says why the BRICS is significant. Now we will understand about the significance of BRICS. See, BRICS has focused its attention on both geopolitical and economic dimensions. This means they discuss important global and regional issues together, and they present a viewpoint that is different from the Western countries. By doing this, BRICS strengthens the trend towards multipolarity in the world, which means the power is shared among multiple countries instead of being dominated by just a few. So this helps to reduce the influence of the Western countries. If we see on the economic front, BRICS has launched some new initiatives. One of them is the New Development Bank, as we saw earlier. Currently, New Development Bank has committed a substantial amount of money, which is 32.8 billion US dollars for 96 different projects. Then another initiative is the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. We discussed this also. We saw that CRA is a financial mechanism that provides protection against global liquidity pressures. This means that if there are economic difficulties or uncertainties BRICS countries can rely on this arrangement to help stabilize their currencies and financial situations. Additionally the article says that BRICS has a comprehensive program in place. This is to expand trade and investment cooperation among the five member countries. This means they are actively working together to increase their economic interactions such as trading goods and investing in each other's countries. Besides this You should also know that BRICS is facing many challenges. The article highlights some negative trends within the BRICS group. We will see that as well. See the trio of India, Brazil, and South Africa, which is known as IBSA, hoped that China and Russia would support their bid for membership in UN Security Council. However, they were disappointed as the support was not provided by China and Russia. And this highlights the diplomatic ineffectiveness of the IBSA group. They know that in recent years China experienced a remarkable economic rise and began asserting itself militarily and this has caused an imbalance within the BRICS group then the consolidation of Russia China cooperation following the Ukraine crisis is also another cause then we also have South Africa's economic struggles which has led to its increased dependence on China apart from this Brazil's shifting political landscape is also causing problem to the BRICS group okay All these factors added new tensions to the BRICS group dynamics. Moreover, China's push for a common currency for intra-BRICS trade further amplified the internal troubles faced by the BRICS group. Despite these problems, currently 19 countries are eager to join BRICS due to various reasons. See, these are the 19 countries. We can go through it. By why do these countries wish to join in BRICS? Firstly, China is playing a significant role in driving the expansion of BRICS. This is because China sees this as a 
strategic opportunity to increase its global influence secondly there is something called fomo which stands for fear of missing out see it is a feeling we all experience when we see others joining a club or group that seems important or influential see many countries don't want to miss out on the visibility and perceived benefits that come with being part of brics so they want to be part of a club that is seeing as significant group so many of the countries wish to join in brics thirdly some countries may be seeking brics membership because they are excluded from other groupings so they see that the doors to other alliances or organizations are closed to them so they turn to brics as an alternative platform lastly they decide to create a forum of the global south plays a role there is a prevailing sentiment among many countries particularly in the global south they feel that the current global order is dominated by western powers so joining brics allows them to be a part of a group that represents the interests of developing nations okay so these are the reasons why some countries wish to join in brics so the next brics summit may address this expansion the option are ranging from mega expansion to limited admission however india prefers gradual expansion based on agreed criteria so if a consensus reached argentina egypt indonesia uae and bangladesh are likely to be admitted in brics forum the author concludes the article by saying that the brics leaders should reflect on strengthening the group and addressing internal imbalances and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about brics then we saw about the evolution of brics then we moved on to see about the financial aspects of brics then we saw about the achievements of brics then we moved on to see about the issues faced by the brics group and finally we saw some points about the expansion of brics group now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this text and context article here this article is about the dispute between andhra pradesh and telangana over the sharing of water from the river krishna so in this regard we will understand the points provided in this news article but before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this article is given here please note it down now first we will look at the origin of dispute between andhra pradesh and telangana over the sharing of waters from the river krishna see this issue is as old as the formation of andhra pradesh yes the krishna river water issue has its origin right from the formation of andhra pradesh as a separate state in november 1956 Before the formation of Andhra Pradesh on February 20, 1956, four senior leaders each from different regions of Andhra Pradesh including the Royal Sima region and the Telangana region signed a gentlemen's agreement. One of the major provisions of this agreement was to ensure the protection of Telangana's interests and needs with respect to the utilization of water resources from the river Krishna. However, the allotment of water from the irrigation facilities was vested with Andhra Pradesh and this left out the rights of Telangana. So this is one of the main reasons for the disputes between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana over the sharing of water from the river Krishna. Further in 1969 the Bachavat Tribunal that is the Krishna Water Dispute Tribunal one was constituted to settle the dispute around water sharing from the rivers of Godavari and Krishna. The primary objective of this tribunal was to settle the water dispute among Maharashtra, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. That is before bifurcation of Andhra Pradesh into Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. The Bachavat Tribunal has allocated 811 TMC FT that is 811,000 million cubic feet water to Andhra Pradesh. However, the tribunal did not make any region wise allocations within the Andhra Pradesh. Later, the Andhra Pradesh government has apportioned the 811 TMC feet water into 512 is to 299 TMC feet ratio between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. So it is the Andhra Pradesh government that apportioned the water between Andhra and Telangana and not Bachavat Tribunal. Apart from this the Bachavat Tribunal had also recommended to divert the water from Tungabhadra dam which is a part of Krishna river basin to the Drod Pon Mahabubnagar area of Telangana. However these recommendations were not followed through. So Telangana had time and again reiterated that the Andhra Pradesh made injustice to Telangana when it came to the matter of distributing water resources. So these are the reasons for the origin of disputes between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana over the sharing of water from the river Krishna. Now we will move on to see about the arrangements made for Krishna river water sharing after the bifurcation of Andhra Pradesh into Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. See Andhra Pradesh was bifurcated into two states that is Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in 2014. This was based on the Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act 2014. But if you look at water sharing there is no mention of water shares between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana in the Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act 
so the bachawad tribunal award was still in force and we saw earlier this award had not made any region wise allocation within the andhra pradesh so to sort out the issue the ministry of water resources organized a meeting with both the states in 2015 In that meeting both the states have agreed to share the water in such a way that Telangana will receive 34% and Andhra Pradesh will receive 66%. But this arrangement is temporary in nature and it is also decided that the ratio of water sharing must be reviewed every year. And apart from this one of the key outcomes of this meeting was to set up Krishna River Management Board and the Godavari River Management Board. These river management boards are established for the efficient management of water resources. Now coming to Krishna River Management Board see the Krishna River Management Board followed the same water sharing ratio without doing the annual review as per the agreement that is the Krishna River Management Board followed 34 is to 66 ratio the Telangana was not satisfied with this arrangement and it had asked for an equal share of water till water shares are finalized and earlier this month also the Krishna River Management Board conducted a meeting but it couldn't convince the member states so it referred the matter to ministry of jal shakti now the ministry is trying to resolve the issue between andhra pradesh and telangana now moving on to see about the stance of both andhra pradesh and telangana over the water sharing from krishna river see right from its formation telangana is asking the central government to finalize the water shares telangana is asking for 70% of water share in the allocation of 811 tmc feet It also highlighted that Andhra Pradesh is diverting about 300 TMC feet outside the basin from the drought prone areas within the basins of Telangana. On the other hand, Andhra Pradesh is demanding higher share of water to protect its own interest. So this is all about the claims by both Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. See when there is a dispute between two or more states, it is the central government that would intervene to sort out the issue, right? Now let us see about the stand of central government regarding the issue of Krishna water sharing. See the central government have arranged for two meetings of apex council with union minister and chief ministers of both the states in 2016 and 2020 respectively. However, this meeting was not fruitful. See earlier Telangana has filed a petition in Supreme Court regarding the Krishna water sharing issue. And later the Ministry of Jal Shakti had given the assurance that it will refer this matter to a tribunal to sort out the issue in an amicable manner. As a result of this, Telangana withdrew its petition from the Supreme Court. And two years went past, but still there are no major developments in this regard. So we have to wait and see what will happen in the future. And this is all about this article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the origin of dispute between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana over the sharing of water from the River Krishna. Then we saw about the water sharing arrangements between Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. And finally we saw some points about the central government's stand on Krishna water sharing issue. See this topic is very much important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this text and context article here it says that co legislators are the european commission signed the carbon border adjustment mechanism and this is the news so in this discussion we are going to understand carbon border adjustment mechanism in prelims perspective now what is this carbon border adjustment mechanism See carbon border adjustment mechanism which is shortly called as CBAM is a phenomenon introduced by the European Union in the year 2021. It was adopted by the European Parliament in 2022. The main objective of CBAM is to avert carbon leakage. See carbon leakage happens when companies relocate the production or manufacturing of carbon intensive materials to countries with less stringent climate rules. This is done to meet climate policy requirements or to avoid restrictions on carbon emissions in their home country. This means that instead of getting sequestered carbon emissions are happening in another place. So this is one definition of carbon leakage. According to European Union, carbon leakage also happens when products manufactured in the European Union that meets the emission standards will get replaced by carbon intensive products imported from other countries. This is because according to European Union products manufactured in the European Union will meet the emission standards but the imported items will be produced without these conditions so European Union is saying that this also results in carbon leakage therefore in order to prevent this and to reach climate change mitigation goals European Union in 2021 came up with a proposal for carbon border adjustment mechanism So mainly CBAM plans to impose a tariff on a set of carbon intensive imports. 
and this tariff have to be paid by European Union importers and companies who export such goods to European Union countries. This way it covers both the definitions of carbon leakage. Now what is the significance of this mechanism? Firstly, CBAM helps in achieving European Union's target of cutting greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030 when compared to 1990 and further to net zero by 2050. Secondly, CBAM helps the European Union's domestic businesses to be on a fairer footing. This is because currently European Union's domestic businesses face the risk of being disadvantaged by cheaper carbon tax free imported products. So CBAM helps the European Union's domestic businesses. So these are the two important significances of carbon border adjustment mechanism. Now before concluding our discussion, let us see how this mechanism impacts India. See the impacts of CBAM are negative for most developing economies. Know that CBAM will be initially applied to imports of certain goods whose production is carbon intensive. The examples of such goods include cement, iron, steel, aluminium, fertilizers, electricity and hydrogen sectors. For India, impacts are projected to be significant for the cement and steel sectors. Under a CBAM scenario, India's cement exports to the European Union are projected to fall by around 65% and iron and steel by 58% in 2030. So India has invoked climate justice on the global fora saying that carbon border adjustment mechanism plays a carbon charge on companies from countries that did not primarily or historically cause the climate change. So this is what the concern of India. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what is carbon border adjustment mechanism. Then we saw about the significance of carbon border adjustment mechanism. And finally we saw some points about impacts to India. Now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article here, the article says that a SpaceX capsule as part of the private mission has successfully docked with International Space Station. This mission carried two Saudi astronauts and they are the first individuals from Saudi Arabia to travel to the International Space Station. So this is the crux of the article given here. Now in this discussion let us understand about the International Space Station from exam perspective. See the International Space Station that is the ISS is a habitable artificial satellite in the low earth orbit. The ISS program is actually a joint project between five participating space agencies. They are the NASA of the United States, Roscosmos of the Russia, JAXA of Japan, ESA of Europe and CSA of Canada. Know that the ownership and the use of space station is established by intergovernmental treaties and agreements. Now coming back to ISS. ISS orbits Earth at an average altitude of 400 kilometers and it completes one orbit around the globe every 90 minutes which means it travels at a speed of about 28,000 kilometers per hour. In fact, the station travels a vast distance in just one day. This is equivalent to going from Earth to the moon and back. That's how fast ISS moves through space. Also know that the space station is approximately the size of a football field. A note on interesting fact here. When you look up at the night sky, you might spot the ISS shining brightly. If you know when and where to look, you can witness the ISS as a bright moving light across the sky even without using a telescope. So how was ISS constructed? See the parts of ISS were taken into space piece by piece and assembled gradually in the orbit. The modules and connecting nodes house living quarters, laboratories and essential facilities. Then the station's structure is supported by exterior framework and the solar panels which provide power. See by the year 2009, the ISS reached its full capacity that accommodating a crew of 6. Later new modules, laboratories and facilities were added and this expanded the capabilities of ISS for research and exploration. You should also know that India is planning to launch its own space station by the year 2030. So India will then join the Allied Space Club with the United States, Russia and China. See the Indian space station will be smaller unlike the ISS and it will be weighing around 20 tons. Its primary purpose will be to conduct microgravity experiments. According to the preliminary plan, the Indian space station will be able to house astronauts for up to 20 days in space. Know that this ambitious project will be an extension of the Gaganyaan mission, which is India's first manned mission to space. Then similar to the International Space Station, the Indian space station will also orbit Earth at an altitude of approximately 400 kilometers. See, to make the space station fully functional, ISRO is actively working on a crucial technology called space docking. Space docking enables the transfer of humans from one spacecraft to another. 
and this will allow various operations and missions to be conducted smoothly in space. So as of now, ISRO's specific focus is on developing and testing the space dogging experiment, that is the SPAD X, and this is to ensure the success of the Indian Space Station. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about International Space Station and we saw some points about India's proposed plan to launch its own space station. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now, look at this first question here. The question asks that which of the following protected areas comes under Mayurbanj Elephant Reserve? See, there are three elephant reserves in Odisha. They are Mayurbanj Elephant Reserve, Mahanadi Elephant Reserve and Sambalpur Elephant Reserve. Out of these three elephant reserves, Mayurbanj Elephant Reserve is the formal name of Simlipal, Kuldiha and Hadghar Elephant Reserve. So Mayurbanj Elephant Reserve includes three protected areas such as Simlipal Tiger Reserve, Hadghar Wildlife Sanctuary and Kuldiha Wildlife Sanctuary. So the correct answer here is option C, Kuldiha Wildlife Sanctuary, Adahar Wildlife Sanctuary and Simlipal Tiger Reserve. Moving on, now look at the second question here. This question is about kelp forests. Now look at the first statement. Kelp species grow well in tropical coastal waters because kelp require sunlight to do photosynthesis. See this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion itself, kelp thrives in cold and nutrient rich waters. This means kelp live further from the tropics. So here first part of statement is incorrect. Whereas the second part is correct. As we saw, kelp require sunlight to do photosynthesis. Overall, the first statement is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, kelps live in a symbiotic relationship with urchins. See, this statement is also incorrect because sea urchins can destroy entire kelp forests at a rate of 30 feet per month by moving in herds. Know that sea waters play a key role in stabilizing sea urchin populations so that kelp forests may thrive. So kelps do not live in a symbiotic relationship with sea urchins. Here symbiosis means benefit for both the species. So second statement is incorrect. Here the question is asking for correct statements. Here both statements are incorrect. So the correct answer is option D neither one nor two. Moving on let's take up the final question. This question is about carbon border adjustment mechanism. Now look at the first statement. It is a mechanism introduced for the first time in COP27. See this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion itself, CBAM is a phenomenon introduced by European Union in the year 2021 and it was adopted by European Union Parliament in 2022. So before COP27 itself, CBAM was introduced. And know that in COP27, all developing countries opposed CBAM. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, it requires importers of certain carbon intensive goods to pay a levy on their imports. See this statement is correct. The CBAM regulation would require importers of certain carbon intensive goods like steel and cements to pay a levy on their imports corresponding to the charge imposed on comparable domestic industries under the European Union emission trading system. So second statement is correct. Here the question is asking for correct statements. Here the correct answer is option B2 only. And displayed here is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in your community section. Try to answer it. And do not worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And do not forget to subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.